The Ski Moms are beyond excited to announce our newest partner, Skeeta. Founder Corinne Prevo started Skeeta in 2007. The Vermont ski racer began making hats for her ski teammates and friends. As the buzz snowballed beyond the New England ski community, new products joined the lineup to keep everyone warm and colorful. 14 years later, the brand is still committed to local production, limited edition products, and a fresh perspective. Each season, Skeeta delights old and new brand fans with whimsical prints for everyone in the family, including dogs. Practical and pretty, layering on ski to pieces for your winter adventures feels like bringing along a friend. Our favorite pieces include the Essential Alpine Neck Warmer and a high pile fleece hat for apre ski, sledding, and walking the dog. New this season, Skeeta has introduced the red, white, and blue Pinnacle Collection by Skeeta. Sales of this exclusive line of headwear and accessories supports the U.S. Ski and Snowboard team, as they represent the United States on the global stage. Whether you're racing to get the kids to ski school, exploring the backcountry, or cruising on a groomer, Skeeta accessories are there to make Ski Mom life more fun. Save 20% off your order with code SKIMOMS20 at checkout. Welcome to the Ski Mom Fun Podcast. We're your hosts, Nicole and Sarah. A quick note to make sure you all know about the Ski Moms Fun website and store. We have all sorts of great Ski Mom swag, from stickers to hats, and we're just loving the soft, quick-drying neck buffs. So please check it out. Go to SkiMomsFun.com and click on Store to see all the goodies and get your own. As always, 10% of the profits go to Share Winter Foundation. Check it out. So the Ski Moms today are talking to Jess Winstanley. She is the co-founder and CEO of Nickel Squash and an intrepid Ski Mom. So welcome, Jess. We can't wait to talk to you and introduce some of our Ski Moms to the world of squash as well. Thank you for having me. We always like to start with your ski origin story. So tell us a little bit about how mountains came into your life, where you learned to ski. So I grew up in Toronto to a outdoor loving ski family. And I remember, I, you know, you guys really brought up some memories, asking some pre questions. And I thought back to my first memories, which I have photos of me in a backpack, like those old school carrying backpacks. I was born in 1980 on my dad's back going cross country skiing when I was less than one year old. So they loved it. They didn't really slow down after they had my brother and I. And um, as far as I can remember after that, you know, we in the winter, we were in the car going by McDonald's for those egg sandwiches before we all started to realize that those weren't good for us um, and headed up to the mountain like every weekend. And then when I was seven or eight, I was reminiscing with my mom they would bring me to a church parking lot where there was a big yellow school bus and I would get on and go with all these other kids. And that's when I started a ski and race program. And so that's really how I, how I got started. And it just went on from there. And so what mountain was it that you started at? You know, I knew you guys would ask me that question and I was trying to figure it out. And I was talking to my mom last night and we we couldn't, we couldn't remember, but it was within, you know, 45 minutes to an hour of Toronto. And it was a hill. I remember it so well in that, you know, when it was cold, we would get to go inside and I would have a donut and a hot chocolate. And like, now I have a 10 year old kid and I, on a break doing something really physical, I don't know if I would let him have donut and hot chocolate, but and would you let him um, yeah. on a, a bus to take him 45 minutes away at age seven? I'm kind of loving this concept, but uh, that's that was definitely, me. That yeah, was I know me. that was you, but, yeah. but, um, <laughs> but I guess my point is like nowadays we're so like micromanaging our kids. We're like their little managers, their little yeah. stage, stage managers. Um, I like the, the fact that your mom just would, you know, put you on this bus knowing that you didn't have any way to communicate with her for the rest of the day until totally. you, you got back. Yeah, no, it was, it was phenomenal. I absolutely, you know, fell in love with it. And I think that that really instilled my deep love for the outdoors, which is still, you know, a massive part of my life today, as well as skiing. And you spent some time in uh, Colorado skiing as well. And that was, that was kind of part of your uh, adult ski life. Yeah, for sure. So I graduated college and I, 
Well, first I did a I did a post grad year in tennis, wanting to play Division One tennis, which in hindsight is hilarious. It was not good enough, um, and ended up playing Division Three, where I had the grace of going abroad for what was supposed to be a semester and turned into a year. And I did a ton of skiing out in France, and um, that was a really really great experience. Followed by then graduating and being like, okay, you know, I, I want skiing to still be a part of my life. And I was, you know, sort of like a wild adventurer, whereas my best friend from high school, Kim Edwards, she was an adventurer, but she was like a planned adventurer. So we were just a great, you know, pair. And she planned for us to move to Aspen after graduation. And I, you know, showed up on a whim, just here I am, let's go, where are we living? And we lived there for two seasons, two years, which was the best skiing of my life. I was a ski instructor by day, bartender by night in the winter, summer tennis pro followed by bartender. And, you know, that really sort of covers like the gamut of what I was interested in at the time. I was interested in being outside, either skiing in the winter, summer, just being outside in general, followed by in the evening, making money and socializing and drinking with my friends. So it was just a blast. Do you think you could still survive in Aspen on two jobs? I wonder if it's that's even like a lifestyle anymore, if you'd have to have like a a camper van you lived in. You do. So you do the um, ski instructor thing mainly for the pass because you get a free pass. And then also, I mean, I personally, I ended up working with kids after that. And so I realized in that time, wow, it's like, it's awesome working with kids because I'm a kid myself in many ways still. And so I fell in love with, with that aspect, but that saves you on the pass. And then followed by bartending in Aspen brings in an extraordinary amount of cash. I remember when I decided that I was ready to go, Aspen can suck you in. You know, I have friends that are still there. And Kim was there for many years, but as Kim is a planned adventurer, she had a very legit job working for Aspen Ski Snowmass. Um, and, but, you know, I have other friends that you just get sucked in and you're there because the, the cash element is very strong. Um, and when I decided that I was ready to go, it took me, I, I think it was three months when I decided, okay, I'm going to get going and three months. And then I had savings for the next you know, six to nine months where I could then move to New York City. So yeah, I, I do think that you can get by, but I would not recommend it as, you know, a really solid lifestyle choice. <laughs> so I just had a, a magnificent time and it really, I think, created an absolute lifelong love of the sport. Sarah, what would would you like, would you be totally stoked if one of your girls was like, yes, we're going to do a year in Aspen? What would you say? I think so. I mean, I hear this story and I'm like, I regret that I, you know, went from college, like right to right to work. And I can tell that, you know, even hearing just tell this, these stories, like I'm, I'm envious. I don't have those stories, you know, and I think you can only do that in a short period of time. Right. I'm guessing you'll tell us when I mean, you said you moved to New York next. Right. And what, yeah. what happened next? Yeah, but you're right, Sarah. I mean, listen, there's pluses and minuses to all of it, right? I mean, I, I could not agree with you more if if you're going to, you know, try and help your child figure out what's the next step. Um, it really is for a limited period of time. And you have to have a personality in which you know when to say no and when to get out <laughs> because you just don't want to get stuck in that lifestyle. Um, ideally, but I did indeed, um, move on from there. So my, my mother has run professional squash tournaments for her whole career, pretty much as an adult. And during this time, high school, college, and then when I was in Aspen, I would go and help her a couple of times a year, run these major squash events. And, um, they were so fun. And so I got into events, you know, by osmosis for my mom and, when Aspen, when I was realizing that I was ready to move on, um, I had an opportunity to go and lobby for a job with a German events company that I was exposed to, thanks to my mom, who ran um, the Masters Tennis Tournament. So like the John McEnroe era of gents who um, were former legends of the sport. And 
So, and they also ran Luciano Pavarotti's North American tour and they were just getting that going. And so it was like, you know, the most Makes sort of total random sense, you know. group. I know, right? It's like, it, it bridges the gap between like the crazy Aspen lifestyle. Of course, I would go work for this German company and like go travel the world. Um, so I worked with them for a couple of years and was exposed to the world of events even further beyond squash and absolutely loved it. I mean, I think that you can tell it really goes with my vibe of life. Um, met some really, really cool people. And so I was in, in New York City as well as Frankfurt, Germany during that period. And um, during that period, I met my husband. His name is Peter Nickel, and he he played squash professionally. Um, he was quite well known in our little world of squash. He was number one for five years. And so he played in all these major tournaments that my my mom ran. I had known him since I was 18. Um, and we f- we fell in love and did the long distance thing, which was so painful and amazing and awesome and all the emotions wrapped up in one. Um, and then all of a sudden, um, bless his soul, Luciano Pavarotti passed away. Um, which was really what kept me in New York and then Frankfurt. And so I was like, oh, hey, I don't have to be here anymore. And he was living in London. Why don't I come move to London? And um, so then that brought me to London, which created my entrepreneurial path. First, away from squash, we started a power plate studio. Um, It is fantastic for ski training, as a matter of fact, for all ski moms out there that have memberships to gyms, check if you have a power plate. I cannot recommend it enough. Um, But it's a piece of equipment that Peter in particular used near the end of his career in squash that saved his body. And squash is, you know, an extremely physical sport. And um, I started to get interested in the body um, in that period and training and optimizing. And um, so we created a business surrounding that. It was my first business, Um, totally burnt myself out you know, took control of everything, didn't trust anyone, did not delegate. So let's take a minute. And for the majority of the listeners, they may not know what squash is. Since I was based in Brooklyn, it is everywhere in Brooklyn, especially if you have active kids, you uh, will run into people carrying these backpacks and you might think they have tennis rackets, but they're actually squash rackets. So tell us what squash is and where we would find it. Yeah. Oh my gosh. It's so prevalent in Brooklyn Heights. I've seen exactly what you're talking about. I love it. Um, so squash is most people are more familiar in North America with racquetball rack and squash is very similar. It's a four walled court and there's uh, two people on the court in general and a ball. Um, the difference between racquetball and squash is that the um, squash racket is longer and the ball is smaller and softer. It's a much more challenging game. And I think that that is largely the reason why racquetball is like the equivalent of Latin in our languages. It's a it's a dying sport and squash is on the rise. And um, racquetball was predominantly just in North America, whereas squash was international. Um, and so now squash is is really the the preferred sport between the two worldwide, including North America. And it is a game whereas you have to hit the ball on the front wall. So you serve the ball, you hit the ball on the front wall, and then your opponent hits the ball, and then you go back and forth thereafter. You can hit off of any wall, which is fun, and which is why I think many people associate it with essentially the chess of sports because it's so strategic. You can hit it off any wall, but it has to hit the front wall before it hits the ground. And it's only one bounce. And you play best three out of five games, and it's first to 11 for each game. Okay, Sarah, what questions do you have? Because Sarah is not, she's never played squash. So this is all news to her. I mean, I've seen it a little bit. Well, I watched it um, when our girls did like a sports camp years ago, but that was, you know, they were very much beginners at it. So I guess given your description, it has to be inside. Yeah, it has to be. Well, there are, there's actually a really cool outdoor court in New York. It doesn't have to be indoors, but it is in a four walled court. Let's take a quick break. We wanted to tell you about our favorite new ski accessory called the ski pack. As you know, we're always looking for ways to make getting to the slopes easier for everyone in the family. And we have found that one of the hardest parts of skiing with kids is getting from the car to the lodge with all our gear. 
So we wanted to share our latest find. It's called the Ski Pack, and it's just like it sounds, a backpack for your skis and poles. There's a reinforced opening at the bottom that's wide enough to allow your skis to go through easily, but prevents the bindings from passing through the opening. It comes in a variety of colors and sizes with adjustable straps, so it will fit most everyone from little kids to adults. It'll last multiple seasons, made out of a really durable, lightweight, and quick drying fabric. The most important thing is that the ski pack will make skiing easier and more fun for everyone in your family. You can check out the ski pack at puremountainfun.com. Use code SKIMOMS2024 at checkout and receive 15% off your order. Discount is not applicable on sale prices. So you don't, you don't need a ceiling. You can, you use the ceiling. You don't need a ceiling. So P- Peter, my husband, for example, his favorite pro squash tournament on the calendar is in Egypt and they build a glass squash board at the base of the pyramids and it's wide open. There's no roof whatsoever. And um, they're playing squash. You know, they're not starting the matches until at 9 p.m. at night, you know, because you need you really need darkness and lights. Otherwise, in the professional game, it's played on a glass court so that you can see through spectators can see inside. And, and so, yeah, it can be wide open, but traditionally for us, you know, regular people, we play indoors um, in a contained facility and it's just like tennis, for example, which I think is, you know, everyone knows tennis, but you have a wall in front of you and you and your partner are standing next to each other. And that's another reason why I love the sport so deeply, because it does two things in that regard versus tennis. First of all, you are so physically close to your opponent. And so you have to work together and against each other in order to get to the ball and get away from the ball. And then, you know, we get into more of the, you know, the the specifics of the game in terms of like when the point becomes somebody else's point because you got in their way, yada, yada. Um, and then the so the the first thing is just that that you know physical closeness and then the second thing is that there's so much more strategy involved because you're in a smaller space and you have these walls that you can also play off of i think it's an absolutely fascinating game i will also say i'm very attracted to it because there's no ball chasing so when the point is over you know in tennis yeah. i remember as a little yeah. kid you're like oh where'd the ball go you know even if you were going with like three a can of you know three tennis balls squash like the next point starts very quickly um and it is you know there's not a lot of downtime in squash um it is also a crazy workout because it moves super fast and i do think it complements skiing which is one of the things i wanted to talk to you about because there's so much lunging because the ball often, you know, drops low. So you are constantly like crouching. Um, and if you're doing it right, you're not like bending over, you're kind of using your legs to to get low. And it's, it builds, I know I, I had some of my best, like transitioning into my ski season when I was playing a lot of squash, because I was, my legs were so strong from all of the squash that took me into skiing. Yeah, totally. We have a lot of skiers that cross train with squash. Um, and, and uh, that's really what I, I use it for too. Cause I'm a pretty like hard, um, well not hard. I live in New York city, but I am an outdoor total enthusiast. So mainly everything I do indoors is just for the things that I love to do outdoors. You know, I ski and surf. Those are my two main sports. Um, but as you mentioned, Nicole, it's like we get the majority of kids in our program really come from tennis because like as soon as they started squash, they're like, oh, you don't have to chase balls. It's so much more exciting and fun. Um, and then, you know, whether they stick with it or not, that's generally the the main reason why they cross over from tennis to squash. Um but it is indeed, it's absolutely fantastic cross training for skiing. It can totally be a life sport. Um, you know, I think that ultimately if you play hard, it's going to be hard on your joints. So the uphill battle that we always have within, you know, with our kids and our adults is, is really what you have to do off court in order to be able to, to be on court. And the same applies to so many other sports, right? I mean, we have to be doing our yoga, our Pilates, our stretching routines in order to continue, at, you know, with our ultimate goal for for everyone really is to live a healthy and happy life. And so it, it's absolutely essential that we view whatever we focus on, 
um, we view with a full picture and a holistic view, like how can I keep doing this for a really long period of time? I, I had a question about what age um, would you recommend if, if, it, if a kid's interested, how, how young can they start? Oh, I mean, like we had a racket in our kid's hand when he was probably two or three. With, you know, you can get really small rackets now. Dunlop makes a great, tiny, fun racket. And then you get the big squishy balls. And so just having that stuff in your house, you know, I think is super fun. And and we don't start our program for our kids until six. And before then, we just really encourage parents to play with their kids. And I think for all of the moms listening, you know, it is possible to be doing this. We do. See, we all see those women in their 80s still skiing and you wonder how they're doing it. Well, they're probably doing it very intentionally. Yeah, totally. And, you know, I also think the biggest thing for all of us is just carving out the time. So no matter what sport we're doing, if you're just adding that 10 to 15 minutes at the beginning and then the end, you're set. You know, you don't necessarily have to go to a full hour long yoga class two or three times to a week to offset whatever extremely physical thing that you're doing. That's really all it takes. Um, but at the same time with squash, the uphill battle that we have, and it's, you know, probably similar for, for many sports, perhaps any listeners out there are thinking this, it's, you know, it sounds very intimidating no matter what age you're at. In particular, though, as we get older to start a new sport. And um, I love to hear that, you know, you started in your mid thirties, I'm in my early forties and like, I took up surfing only a few years ago and I just think squash and many other sports, it, it's, it's never too late. You know what I mean? And I just think that it's really eye opening and something that I'm really committed to is just to keep trying new things you know, especially as I get older and just trying to stay active with keeping my mind open and using my body in different ways. And that's what surfing has really done for me as I continue as well with, with skiing now that that's come back into my life. So let's talk a little bit about skiing. You said you're New York based and I know um, Nickel Squash is about to open a second location. So you're, you're pretty busy, but how do you all fit skiing in as, um, you know, a, as a family that's based in the city? When you know, finally, we got to the age of two with our son, Bodhi, Bodhi, like point break Bodhi. Um, we were like, okay, you know, my husband was a, was a uh, squash player, not a skier. And, but I was like, this is going to be a part of our lives. This is going to be what we do as a family. And I'm so excited to get back out there and ski, you know, I'll do some research and let's get moving. So we, we started with Mohawk and, um, and then we went on from there to try all the other mountains that I knew of. So Catamount, Hunter, Wyndham, Jiminy V, so on and so forth. And they were all fabulous for our son Bodhi to learn. And, um, the point is, is that I personally was sad because I felt like, okay, we're living in New York city. I know we're going to be here for a long time and there's no mountain for me. There's a great mountains for my son as he's a learner and he's a little kiddo and great mountains for my husband who's learning, but there's nothing for me. And I just sort of thought that this was, you know, how it was going to be. And then dun, 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 I was reading, I was on your Facebook group and I, it was 2021. So like, you know, deepest, darkest COVID out in New York city. Like I'm in small business in an indoor sports service. I mean, it was like hell. And, um, and I remember reading a post, I have to look back and find out who this magical ski mom is, but she posted from that day at Platakill Mountain, um, like, you know, total face shots of snow going off piece, like all this kinds of kind of stuff that I didn't think existed really within driving distance of New York City, because everything is very like rule oriented on piece, so on and so forth. And as you can tell so far, I'm not a big fan of rules. Um, and so that was at like nine o'clock at night. And I looked on the Platica website and found that it was what they call their snow days. They're traditionally only open on a Friday, Saturday, Sunday, but if it, if, if they have a dump, then they will open up midweek and that your, your member, your ski mom had obviously been there that day posted. And, um, and then I found out it was open the next day, um, which was like, I don't know, Wednesday or Thursday or whatever. And I looked over at my husband. And I was like, hey, would you be cool if I took our, our kid Bodie out of school tomorrow and we left crazy early and I want to go check this place out. And the snow is looking good. He was like, yeah, of course. He's so supportive. 
And um, so Bodhi at the time was six, took him out. We left at a crazy hour. We were on the mountain by 839. And I mean, I was like in heaven. It was, this mountain was like, so my vibe. They were like playing reggae in the lodge and there was fires outside, you know, um, and then on the mountain itself, like you could ski anywhere. You can ski through any set of trees. You can go wherever. There's only two lifts. It's super homey, but it services like a, a large bar- part of the terrain. And it's in this little sort of enclave and bowl that has greater snowfall than a lot of the other areas that I was going to. And the best part of the day was Bodhi going through powder and he lost his ski and it was underneath a um, a lift, like a, a little two person lift. And people were like cheering for this little six-year-old. And then they started to like coach us, be like, wait, no, the ski's over there. Wait, no, we we think it's over there. And we took 20 minutes and finally found a ski buried. Um, given we haven't really had that great snowfall since, but at the same time, I, I deeply fell in love with that mountain and it brought skiing back to my life. Um, I got Bodhi into the, the race program that year. They took him in, even though he was pretty young, he's a good little skier. Um, and the rest is history. So in terms of our busy lifestyles, um, first it was just Bodhi and I going, you know, the first year we couldn't afford to rent anything just because, you know, of the deepest, darkest COVID and, and our type of business. Um, so I did day trips. I did three hours up, three hours back every Saturday and Sunday with Bodhi, um, while Peter would man the club. And, um, and then, uh, we started renting the year after, um, and we would just go, just go every single weekend. Never, I've never skied Plaid Kill. Um, it definitely, when I went to the website, it said it's all very much telling the story of family owned and operated. And it sounds like that, that is the vibe. So do you get a season pass? Is it on a pass? How do you, um, ski there? Yeah. So I just do the Platy season pass. I've done it every year. Um, and it's really the only place that I need with my lifestyle. And, you know, if, if we swing a big trip, we swing a big trip. Like we went to Europe last year as well, back to St. Anton. Um, but the Platy pass is, is all I need. I have such a great community out there. The kids program is phenomenal. Um, it's a race program, but it's super relaxed. Um, my kid did one race and he was amazing, but it turns out that he has absolutely no interest in racing. He's obsessed with soccer and he absolutely loves the sport though. I think he's definitely going to be a lifer. He just says, you know, racing and being competitive is not of interest, but that's the vibe with the race program there. You know, there, there's some very serious racers in that program and there's kids like my kid and all of the parents are all skiers and, you know, everyone's into it. Um, there are several parents as well. Now that I'm thinking about it, who actually, um, prefer snowshoeing, for example, there's some great snowshoeing at Platy. Um, and then we all just convene. We have a race shack that we all hang out at and, you know, you make a fire, you have drinks together. The vibe is indeed very, you know, small business family owned, which is very rare in the, the New York skiing area. Um, well, pretty, you know, nationwide now. And it speaks to me as a small family business owner myself. And um, it really, I think, dictates the vibe. It's super chill. It's very warm. You know, people know each other. The majority of people that, that are there are season pass holders. Um, and if people are listening to this and they're going to give it a whirl this winter, just make sure you book in advance because it sells out. And that's another thing I love deeply. They really do a great job of limiting the number of people on the mountain. I don't think I've waited longer than like three minutes in a line ever to get up the mountain. It's not a great mountain for total beginners. Um, you know, I think that Bel Air down the road does a better job catering to total beginners. Um, but if you're advanced beginner onwards, it's fantastic. And so did you say that it's about a three hour drive? Is that yeah, if- yeah, three hours on on a good day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's not too bad. That's perfect for a weekend. I mean, when you were doing that in a day, that's quite a quite a bit. But it sounds like it sounds awesome. Yeah, I haven't been there either. Can you tell us more about the resort? Is there is it just a little lodge, or is there is there more of a village and a town? Um, there is a town. Roxbury is a really cute town, but it's not at the base. It's a ten minute drive away. Um, there's some awesome accommodation in the area. There's uh, um, the Roxbury Hotel is this like super cool hotel. 
the platy has three tiers in the lodge. You know, a lot of the platy vibe is outside. So there's the the three tiers, but then there's a really awesome outdoor area with fire pits. Um, so we generally, you know, when I started there, obviously in COVID, so we were outside the entire time. Um, but indoors, you know, it's a, it's just a traditional lodge. They play, they play good tunes though. The food I think is great. Um, the bar on the upstairs, which has a great view of the mountain is awesome. Um, like a really big bar space again. Like, I just love that. It's never way too, it's not too crowded. Um, and there's like a nice delineation, you know, upstairs, it's very kid friendly, but it's largely the adults and it's like the apre crowd, um, mixed with also the outdoor. And then on the main floor, it's like, you know, the, the cafeteria, for example, and lots of kids. And then in the downstairs, it's where you go and get your rentals. And um, yeah, and I just love that place. It really is. So it's, I think it's the best. <laughs> <laughs> it does have when I did uh, check it out online, it does have a much larger vertical than some of the other mountains. It was um, over a thousand uh, foot vertical drop. So it was 1100. Um, and that if you are a more advanced skier, that means you're going to get some steeper runs, some longer runs as well, which can be more fulfilling for your ski day. Yeah, totally. And then again, I mean, for me, off piste is is like my my favorite part of skiing. Um, when I say off piste, I shouldn't call it off piste. There, it's really just going through the trees. Everything is open, um, and uh, that that's the that's the main thing that I fell in love with with Platykill is just the fact that it is so open minded in how they have planned their mountain. They have an incredible ski patrol. And so I think that that's, you know, the the main reason why they probably can do it is their patrol as well, which is all volunteer based. These people are absolutely phenomenal. Um, and then also the fact that they keep it so small, there's only two lifts and um, whether it's a, a legal reason or it's by design, they limit the amount of people that are on that mountain every day. So um, I think that that is what allows them to be able to open everything up. And it is just so fun. You know, I can go and there's a great rock, for example, that myself and I love to go at the end of the day with the kids because they're like as crazy as I am and we'll go off all sorts of stuff. And um, there's like, you know, one specific rock, but there's a few of them that you know, you, you plan your descent to get to the right spot and then you just put your skis straight and off you go. And it's like a good six foot drop. And like, that's not cordoned off. That's wide open. And I think just, you know, there's an, a really nice element of trust at that mountain in the sense of it's similar to when I was in St. Anton, for example, like there's a ton of incredible off piece and back country. And that is very specific off piece and back country. And no one goes unless you have the proper gear. Like you have a beacon, you have a shovel, you have a partner, you have everything. And there's a certain sense of responsibility, even though it's wide open. And that's something that I also love in a very smaller, obviously, sense at Platykill. You know, just be smart. Don't be dumb. And off you go. Have fun. I would love to ask you, because you do run the 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 nickel squash programs and something that we're seeing is, you know, kids specializing so early uh, that they are becoming at age seven and eight, like a one dimensional athlete. You know, the kids are going all for soccer, or I think it happens with swimming and basketball. What are your feelings about these mono dimensional athletes? Because you're seeing these kids, you see when they burn out, you're seeing like the kids that flourish. What do you think are some of the keys to success? As we see it all the time. You know, we've worked with kids now for 15 years. We have a monodimensional nine-year-old. He's obsessed with soccer. Um, he plays on a, a year-round team and it's all he wants to do. And he wants to play professionally and he's nine. And I'm certainly not going to squash his dreams and I'm going to support him as much as possible. In squash, you know, we, we find the same thing. In particular, now there's increased pressure to specialize early because that's like the only way now that you're going to get recruited to play in college, for example. And I think, to be honest, it's very individual. We have had lots of incredible experiences with kids who specialized as young as like, you know, seven or eight. 
And they are still so deeply in love with the game and they've graduated college. This is how old we are now and how long we've been doing this. And that like, we have kids coming back who have like graduated college two or three years ago. A big learning um, process is for the parents, first and foremost. You know, I think that as parents, the times that we've seen burnout, to be honest, I, I don't want to make anyone feel nervous here because we all just want to do what's best for our kids. But it has been through knowledge or not, parents putting pressure on the child. I think that there's some incredible literature out there and podcasts out there for us parents to educate ourselves as to how we can support our athletes and how we can be there for them. And, you know, my personal definition of that is to support my child who would personally like to specialize. I would not push anyone into anything that they do not want to do in particular at a young age. Um, you know, we had a vision that we were going to have that our child was going to play a wide variety of sports for as long as possible and maybe decide on something by the time he got to like middle school or high school. It just didn't work out that way with our kids so far. But we're like wide open, not that we're necessarily going to get it right, but from what I've learned is just being open to change. And, you know, yes, let's say that your your child falls in love with one sport and then they want to make a change after they've accomplished so much and, you know, they, they are on the precipice of having this be a huge part of their life, maybe even play collegiately, for example, and just being open to that change. You know, Nicole, we could all learn from you. I got to know your incredible daughter last summer, and I, I was just so amazed she had done so much as an incredible skier. And then she wanted to get back into squash. And you fully supported that. And I just thought that that was a beautiful thing. And so that's a great example, I think, of not leading your child to burnout. <laughs> In You know, New York City is a very particular child. You know, the, these kids, for example, they, they don't have as much opportunity from what I see to specialize because it is a very intense academic environment as well. There, there's sort of a, a natural bifocus, even if you have chosen squash as your sport. Um, whereas, you know, I have friends who own squash clubs who are in suburbs and, and it's a very different thing. You know, it, it's, it, it, there's not as much, um, academic intensity, for example. And so those kids do have the ability to pay, to play six to seven days per week. Um, and that's not necessarily something that we see in New York city, but we are, as you noted, we're opening in New Jersey next year, squash and pickleball together. Um, and I'm really, you know, excited to see what, what that looks like in terms of, of the kids who are there, what their focus is. Um, there's not a big squash presence out there. So I think a lot of people will be starting it for the first time. We do have some kids who come to us from the Rumson area to New York City. So we, you know, already have like a small base out there. But, um, you know, I do wonder indeed if this will be the next sort of interesting phase of our careers and our dedication to working with kids and understanding how we can best support them um, in terms of what you had noted, burnout, you know, it's very real. We have seen it very often. We just don't really see it too often in New York City yet. We do see burnout academically, don't get me wrong, <laughs> but I would say it's academics, you know, the pressure of academics more than necessarily um, the specializ the specialization of a sport. Yeah. And I think in, in addition to just thinking about burnout from just doing one thing all the time, something you mentioned earlier about trying new things and using your body in, in new and different ways, I feel like that's another very important aspect, whether it's that you're getting more cardio from one sport or the way you are moving, the muscles that you're using. Like, I know that there's a lot of, you know, research out there that just talks about the importance of doing a variety of different sports and movements instead of just always the same thing over and over year round. Totally, totally Sarah. And I'm glad you mentioned that because, you know, we so often as moms, we think about our kids all the time. How can we support them? And we have to think about ourselves. And so we have to think about our own burnout. And I, you know, all of us are gathered behind what you guys have created because, you know, we obviously have external interests. We're all interested in skiing. And so, but, you know, whether we are small business owners working as executives we're working from home. We are taking care of our families as our full-time jobs. These are all such intense jobs, no matter what they are, that it can lead for burnout for us so easily. And I do think 
we, if we're all listening to you guys, we're all adventurous and we all, you know, desire to ski and get out there and have these connections, but we have to, you know, remember to, to put ourselves first as much as we can, which is probably like a really silly thing to say because it's like impossible, but, (laughs) but, you know, as you had noted, trying new things and, and doing things that will keep us from burnout. I work so hard and, you know, the, the life that we have chosen is so intense And, um, if I don't make sure to try surfing and to, I, for the first time I'm going on a ski girls trip, we're going to go to, to Jackson hole. Oh, that makes me so happy. I love, I love when people make space for these girls ski trips. That's awesome. It was so exciting. And I'm going to make all of them get behind this podcast and listen to it. They're all squash people. And, um, and we're all going and we're all moms and we're going to go on the ski trip together. And, you know, that's a part that came, that decision came from a discussion of, you know, us feeling pretty burnt out and we need, we need to do something. We need to do something for ourselves. So yeah, I'm, I'm super pumped. I've never been to Jackson. Well, I love that you put something on the calendar. Sarah and I are hatching a plan to go to Breckenridge right now. And it's so nice to have that, the, that little pin in your calendar that of hopefulness totally. of this is when my, my girl's weekend is. And with that, we will leave you with our question. You know, how do you love to end a ski day? Maybe it's with Bodhi or maybe it's, you know, with your girlfriends, but what is, what is your, were your favorite end of day traditions? My favorite end of day tradition is I'm just visualizing Platykill. It's like my happiest apre place. And I have a hazy IPA in my hand. I'm outdoors around uh, one of the fire pits at the lodge the kids, there's like a really fun sort of um, hill, unofficial hill that they can slide down. And there is reggae playing in the background and the kids are having a blast hooping and hollering and I'm catching up with all the other uh, skiers. It sounds perfect. And if anybody, you know, is heading out, is heading out to Platy, just put it on the, the ski moms group. Or we didn't I'm just ask. so grateful that you guys are doing what you're doing, mm-hmm. bringing us, you know, moms together and um, it, it really makes me feel cool again to be a part of this group. And, <laughs> um, and so I just really am very grateful to the two of you for the community that you've created in this podcast. And, um, I, I can probably speak to every person listening that we're very grateful. Oh, th- thank you so much. Thank you. It was so great to talk to you. For this week's bonus content, we're talking to Jess about the statistics of women and men in the squash world and in sports in general. We're so grateful to our premium subscribers and we give them the podcast ad-free with bonus content. If you're considering subscribing, now is the perfect time. Click the link in show notes and you can become a member right away. Hi, Ski Moms. It's Nicole here. You might have heard this message in our podcast feed. The episode you are requesting requires a subscription. Please follow the link in the show notes to subscribe and listen now. We're not trying to annoy you, we swear. It's simply a way for us to offset the production costs of running this podcast. Believe it or not, Sarah and I bootstrap the entire operation. For just $3 a month, you get access to ad-free episodes and bonus content. It's our way to say thank you for supporting us. Thank you so much for listening to the Ski Moms Fun Podcast. Please be sure to subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. Head to the SkiMomsFun.com website to check out our swag and find out more about our community. And be sure to follow us on Instagram at Ski Moms Fun. We'll be back next week with more interviews and insights. Thanks, Snow. Winter is here and it's time for outdoor adventures. Skiing, hiking, and sledding can make a family hungry. This winter, there's an awesome solution for moms. A new cookbook for moms who ski and ride. The Ski Moms Cookbook is a digital cookbook with 36 recipes that are easy to follow and mom tested. We've got everything from make ahead breakfast to lunch that can travel to the lodge to slow cooker dinners that'll be ready when you get home from your ski day. Some of my favorite recipes are the apple and cinnamon oatmeal, the turkey lettuce wraps, the slow cooker ribs, and of course, the lasagna soup. For $8.99, you're going to get lots of inspiration this winter. And as always, 10% of the profits go to the Share Winter Foundation. Shop the link in show notes or head to our Ski Moms Fun shop. Thank you.